in Taiwan, most people don't drink craft beer. Taiwan's beer has always been monopolized by the government for the longest time, and it's just starting to um, to boom. I knew how to brew, but knowing how to brew and opening up a brewery are two totally different things. German beer is a, so boring. The craft beer market in Asia is, is growing at, a, at, a, at a, a vast rate. I'm sorry, but I just have to say something. I'm very happy with this beer. I want to make sure people know beer is not just beer. Sometimes beer can be an art. America is the first um, trigger for me to start to test a craft beer. The Americans and some brewers, some breweries start a craft beer revolution. This is uh, very, very stupid because there is no craft beer revolution. The last thing we need is another label to argue over. We are striving for 100% local. We have the privilege to interpret beer in a Taiwanese way. If you wanted to buy beer brewed in Taiwan before 2002, you could only buy it from this brewery here in the center of Taipei. It was under Japanese rule that the first brewery was set up here in Taiwan. And in 1919, the Takasuka Brewery was the first beer to be brewed here. Taiwan Brewery is dying in 1919s. Us from uh, the Japanese built it. In 1945, the RC Republic of China government came to Taiwan and receive the brewery. And our first Taiwan beer was in going to produce in 1946. For the longest time, Taiwan's uh, beer market was owned by the government. So um, most of the locals here are still very used to the idea that beer should be made by the government owned a brewery. 90% or 99% of Taiwanese drink Taiwan beer before and they will keep drinking it because in every situation, in every condition, you can see it on the table. On the 1st of January 2002, the beer industry changed forever. Taiwan joined the World Trade Organization and suddenly Taiwan beer had competitors. Before WTO, we are the only corporation was allowed to sell wine, beer, everything, liquor, and tobacco. And after WTO, everything is getting harder every year. And because of the challenge and competition, people buy Taiwan beer because it's the only beer they could buy. So after WTO, the first challenge is people got a chance to try other beer. They found the beer could be delicious. After 2002, because of joining WTO, the government has to open the beer industry to uh, commercial to commercial entity. And after 2002, there are uh, majorly uh, foreigners who uh, marry Taiwanese and stay choose to live in Taiwan. They start uh, brew their own beers in Taiwan and also there are some Taiwanese people who travel a lot or experience the uh, beer culture, Western beer culture and start to thinking about develop the business in Taiwan. I start to drink uh, craft beer in in like 2000, 2005, 2005 and uh, at that time, the Belgian beer, the only Belgian beer you can buy in Taiwan, they, they are Caribbean. At that time, no like the American happy beer or like the other, like the uh, Australia Caribbean, no, at that time. There is no other option, only Belgian beer. I think the Belgian style is more drinkable. My favorite 
the beer brand is Oba. So you can keep drink Oba, maybe three, three bottle, four bottle, and you won't start it. But if you drink like a like a IPA, probably two, or probably two, you will think you you are full. Uh, this is a North Taiwan RB Classical A beer. It's a RB style of Belgian Belgian RB beer. Uh, this is our first one project. We were one of the very first private company to acquire the brewing license in Taiwan back in 2002. And then there was us and also North Taiwan. So we were actually the only two other um, breweries that existed in Taiwan. Originally we brewed only three different styles of beers. And the Sanmai actually means the lager, the dark lager, and the Hefeweizen. So San means three, and the Mai means the malt. So you know, it's actually referring to the styles of the beers. Another brewer who applied for a license in 2002 is Taipei brewer Jollies. What beer did you start to make? First is a Pearson, Pale Ale, and Weizen. Why did you go for the European? Because uh, in that time, the people in Taiwan, they didn't know what is a other kind of beer. Only it's can beer, like the Taiwan beer. It's more easy, more easy for people to try, begin to try. The people cannot accept the legal right. Most people didn't know at that time. Only the Taiwan beer company can brew the beer. So they think our beer is unlegal, so it's unhealthy. Not safety. It is more difficult to introduce this the micro brew beer to people at that time. It was pretty new here when I when I got here. There were not a lot of people doing it, um, and a lot of people were just figuring out how to do it. Um, but I'd been doing it in San Diego, and I'd homebrewed in Australia. And, and when I got here, it was you know I just set up a little set up at home. At the time in Taiwan, there was uh, not a whole lot of good uh, craft beer, good fresh craft beer being made here. Uh, so a lot of people that, that got into it, uh, home brewing, we all had this previous passion for you know, good fresh craft beer, so we just had to make it here uh, at home. At Red Point was around, there was an old uh, company called 886. Uh, we all kind of started in the same uh, time frame, and um, but yeah, we were, you know, you have TTL and you had um, Chinksa Semi, they were around, um, but weren't really doing like American style craft beer. So when Red Point 23 and 886 came in, we really brought that new wave of uh, American style craft beer to Taiwan. The Americans and some brewers, uh, some breweries start of craft beer revolution. And this is um, this is uh, very very stupid because there is no craft beer revolution. The Belgium were making good beers for centuries, as the Germans, as in, as England, and also French. So and now the, the Americans come and say, "Hey, we're doing other beer." Suddenly, it's craft beer revolution. Give me a break. You know, the first time I heard cr the phrase craft beer, I kind of resisted it uh, because I just thought the last thing we need is another label to argue over. Do you think they've got it wrong in Taiwan calling it craft beer? Mm, no, French people also got it wrong. Some people, they, they come to me and say, wow, uh, the craft beer revolution is, uh, is on, on its way. Beer were, were, beers uh, were always there. People have been struggling to define it for many, many years now, and I don't think I certainly personally have ever seen a definition that absolutely encapsulates it. All of us drink really cheap business beer before, then we meet craft beer, and it's, all, uh, it's also why craft beer have to call craft beer. If they say it's just a beer and nobody will look at it, they just think, oh, it's just an expensive beer. beer. So if we said it's a craft beer. It means um, it used a lot of um, hard work on it. If you ask five or five 
breweries, what is craft beer? Five, you're gonna get five different answers, you know? Uh, for, for me at least, or for us at least, it's just a question of attitude, I think, mostly, you know? How we approach our beer, how we approach uh, business, how we approach uh, collaborations with other breweries. I'm not a big fan of the, the, the definition uh, or even the, the term craft beer. Uh, so because it's sourced upon you, do you think? By other countries? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think it's very confusing. I think only in the US um, people really adhere very strictly to the definition uh, and people or breweries who have a change in ownership for example would be kicked out of the official craft beer ranking uh, so that would only happen the, in the US. In Europe there is no real definition um, and in Asia I think it's even worse. Uh, it's a very blurry, very very confusing um, companies like um, companies like ABI, uh, especially in China, they use that weakness uh, that craft brewers or small brewers, high quality product brewers are not able to communicate what they are. Um, so uh, ABI m moves in with uh, um, with Goose Island, for example, and it's uh, they, they plaster the word or the term craft beer um, everywhere. Uh, and that's probably the least craft beer you could get currently in China, um, but it's everywhere. So uh, it's it's a it's a very um, interesting topic, and it'll, it'll be interesting to see how brewers in China, especially the the, the the craft brewers in China and in Taiwan, and like generally in in, in our uh, area here, can actually work against that and communicate uh, what what we are and what we do and how we are different. So a big manufacturer could still produce a craft real ale? Yeah, absolutely, many do. And you look at some of the bigger British breweries and they're producing real ale. Some people will claim it's not craft because they're too big, they're too ubiquitous. Um, the beer they produce is, is not done in small batches and not done with that artisan quality, which some people believe defines craft. But certainly, by many people's definitions, um, there are real ales being produced that are very much craft beer. Um, there's craft beer being produced, it's very much real ale. When I first got into craft beer, uh, that phrase did not exist. At that point it was called micro-brewed beer. And frankly that term was just as cloudy as craft beer is. Craft beer is a right word, but uh, a lot of people misunderstand what the craft beer means. Because they think that like the small brewery, they, they mean craft beer, but I don't think that. I think small brewery, they have to brew very good, very excellent beer, so they have the quality to, to be called craft brewery. Based on American Brewer Association, craft beer has to be like very independent and use the traditional way. But TTL, which is Taiwan, uh, like Taiwan beers, they use like rice or corns to, to, like, to, to brew their beers. It's not just like hops, uh, uh, yeast, uh, malt and water. So I don't, I don't consider them as craft beers. What should be in a craft beer? Just these four most important ingredients, water, yeast, uh, barley, and, and hops. Somehow, but we are trying to adapt to the Taiwan, like the drinking culture. So somehow, um, because the market, like people like that, tends to like that more. So that's why I create like a peach cider to make it taste a little bit more sweet. And well, technically it's not really a craft beer, but we, I mean, it's just one of our products. It doesn't mean we are not a craft beer brand. All the brewers in Taiwan adding fruit, vegetable, whatever to their beer, they shouldn't really call it craft beer. Well, I don't consider it as a craft beer. Well, it's, it's, it's a beer with different flavors, but craft beer has to just focus on the rules, like the German law. Especially like the German law, right? Like only hops, yeast, and those, the basic and most important thing to call it as craft beer. But it's still a beer, but it just maybe use the traditional to make it, but the ingredient wise, it's not really fit the standard of, of craft beer. Craft means uh, handmade 
or that you know it's a combination of artistry and engineering. So for me, yeah, it actually is quite accurate as a description, but it actually really means nothing to the common consumers. The term craft beer is, is the right term because craft beer is small breweries who make beers. It's called craft beer. So all Taiwan uh, breweries, they are all small breweries. But a craft beer is you have to drink as fresh as possible. It's not a fashion of so the craft beer. But to know the quality, you want to drink quality, you don't drink craft beer to be honest. I don't like to define craft because um, I think beer is just a beer. Like make you like very easy drinking and you can drink whenever, wherever with your friends or in any occasion. So if you want to define like craft beer, it sounds like it you, you have to spend more money or it's hard to get. Craft beers are it's not about the brewery, but the size of the brewery, okay? So um, a bigger brewery can make craft beers. Craft beers means like that they are um, really getting into the, into the old traditional way of brewing and not looking only for making money out of the product, like using so less mold as possible, just as looks beer, using fake hops or whatever, you know, extracts and all this kind of stuff. No, craft beer means you using real raw materials, okay, using old traditional recipes, looking for the product, the, the traditional stand of the product, not just trying to make money out of it, try to give the customer something special, what, well, what the beer history is um, famous about and what everybody loves about it, you know. So that's the nice thing, that's, that is craft. Craft beer is a new product per se in Taiwan. So I, I treat it as a, a culture and creative kind of thing. So that's why I try to do crow. So I want to make sure people know beer is not just beer. Sometimes beer can be art. Beer can be something cool, can be something fun instead of just drinking it and then let it out. I have a problem with the, the, the Mandarin terminology of craft beer. But I think for, in, uh, for, for English purposes, craft is, is okay. So the Mandarin word is jingyang. And jingyang means to brew on a more, jing is to be, to be better, to be very good at something. And uh, jingyang is to be, niang is to brew, so, which basically means you're brewing on a, on a higher quality, on a, on a, on a, at a, at a you know, top tier standard, I think. And I think I, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think, I think craft, a better translation for craft is gong yi. Gong yi is, um, gong is, gong is like industry, and yi is like art. So I think for craft, a better translation for craft would be gong yi, which is the, because making beer is, a, it's a beer industry. It's, it's still a factory, it's still a brewery, it's still, you know, it's very scientific. But um, uh, brewing beer, uh, taking brewing beer almost like you're, you're cooking, where there's a lot of variety, a lot of choices, and a lot of, um, for the brewer, there's a lot of um, creative liberty that they can take that they want to express, uh, we want to express different tastes and different ideas in the beer. I think that's the art side of it. So I think a better translation would be for, at least for my understanding would be gong yi, which is the, the science part and the art, artistic creative part blended together. Instead of being just, oh, we're craft beer is better quality beer, or, or, or I don't think that's a very good definition. Here we got the same problem with the challenge from the craft beer. So we invent craft beer for to to compete with other foreign beer. So the problem is still people were sold the Taiwan beer. Now they could agree Taiwan beer tastes okay and the price is good to them. But if you want to convince them to pay more for better beer, they will now think about Taiwan beer. They will first try the foreign beer. So only very few very uh, we'll say very royalty customer will give Taiwan beer a chance to try our new craft beer. Everyone try our craft beer will agree that craft beer is a very delicious one.
but uh, still not so many people give our give us this chance for our new craft beer. Craft beer is a new thing, a new culture to Taiwanese. So somehow for people to little by little to get used to drinking so-called craft beers, sometimes it takes a while. But in order for them to get there right away, we use tea, fruit, or different special ingredients for people to easier to adjust. Just like for them to drinking something maybe like beer, but also drink like like uh, like 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 juice, just like cider. You know, it's hard for them to just get there and and, and get used to it right away. So I think that's the process of getting there. Since beer is not the special crab beer, it's not the majority drinks that people drink in Taiwan. You know, a lot of people, uh, when they're making craft beer, they're adding a lot of stuff. Kind of, you know, they, they want to get people's interest in it and a lot of gimmicky kind of additions to the beer, uh, which is, you know, great for one, one drink. And after that, you're like, okay, I'm going back to a lager or an IPA, something, you know. We don't like to do that. We might add, you know, one or two fruits into a, a pretty otherwise normal beer um, because we want people to keep drinking it. And I mean, with our brand, we, we try to make beers that you can just drink beer after beer after beer. And uh, that's what we believe uh, is what people want, you know, that's what we want. When I go into a place, I don't want to have, you know, a potato, carrot, passion fruit, <laughs> stout, you know. I'm going to have a few sips of that and say, okay, I'm ready for a normal beer now. Um, so we see that a lot. Uh, you know, even in America, you see that. Now 而且這個剛開始開放的時候對差不多四五年 when you promote your beer, do you mm -hmm. try and educate the public about the flavors, what's going into it? Not so much. Initially, we try to, but not anymore. Like, flavor is very... Individual? It's very subjective. subjective. It's very subjective. We're so heavily influenced by industrial food here in Taiwan. Most kids are growing up with McDonald's and Coke. So, um, we're not as particular towards the flavor now. Even though we're roughly about a generation and a half away from farming, from a predominantly farming society to an industrial society. We have very cheap street food, so people don't cook anymore. Kids are so distanced from what, what they eat nowadays. So uh, a lot of time we're actually, actually educating them regarding uh, what corn looks like. So instead of just selling beers, we what. We're more teaching them about what agriculture is, what produce looks like. I think in general, like when we talk about flavor and ingredients, you're talking to a very small portion of the population here. We have a lot of street food because street foods are so easily accessed and so cheap. So we're, so, we're very distant from a home cooked meal. Um, that makes communicating a little harder. Definitely, yeah, but I think there's definitely, we have a lot of fine dining here in Taipei. Um, it's, it's, it's a growing trend. There's definitely a, a, a population that cares about flavors and, and tastes. Do you think Taiwanese people will pay more to drink a craft beer? Mm. Uh, is it going to be difficult trying to get them to upgrade to a different taste? Mm. 
people live in Taipei could maybe they are easy to pay for craft beer I think because uh, you know Taipei is such a capital city um, people they look they want to make themselves look fancy so craft beer is kind of an iconic icon for them so when they drink craft beer it also means they are that kind of people they are fashion they are on the 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 wave of craft beer all the local people they like a sweet uh, more than the bitter we know the all the traditional craft beer uh, the beet feelings is always have but for the Taiwan local peoples they don't like a bitter they like a sweet I wanted to make something that Taiwanese when they smell it they immediately understand what it is to take these back to France how do you think the French would react to that? not the Wulong Wulong they won't understand and Wulong is not that popular the, if I say green tea Okay, they will get it. Uh, if I say black tea as like English tea, yeah. yes, they will get it. But Wulong, they will say, what is it? But this, they don't need to know the pepper. Tea is, um, is uh, becoming popular, but I'm not sure that the public in France who drinks tea will cross over the public that drinks beer. I'm not sure. And even I may... Uh, a couple of famous brewers, international brewers, taste this beer. They needed information before I served them the beer, the, the beer. They would say, okay, explain to me because I don't get it. This, this one, the pepper, don't need explanation. The, 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 the taste, they don't have reference for that. Or, or, or if they have, they think of Sichuan uh, pepper, stuff like this. So they have a, some idea. So they know where they're going when they drink the, the, this beer and immediately actually they like it. It's a typical local, very local flavor. It's not something in the Chinese culture, it's very Taiwanese. I brew Taiwan head brewer TL in North Taiwan Brewing. A lot of the brewery, they start to bring TL because uh, I I create a, I create a TL this rest uh, this style two or three years ago, but and uh, they earn a lot of popularity in Taiwan. TL. So, do you think other brewers have copied Taiwan? I think it's a concept, not a copy, because because I have my own the like the process tea process how to add the tea flavor into beer. I have my own and the unique way, and the, the other brewer, they have their own, they have own process. So I won't say, I won't say this is copy, but uh, it's a concept. But the idea of putting tea in beer, were you uh, In one Taiwan, I am the first one. It's so now the world's copied Taiwan? Uh, but China or Southern, Southern East, Southern East Asia, uh, they, they have their own tea, they have their own spice. So but do you think it started from Taiwan, the concept of mm, tea and beer? I won't say that. The way that Chris has approached this whole beer creation, um, let's say, uh, roadmap was, again, very scientific. So we started out talking about different possibilities of adjuncts that we could use from Asia, uh, especially from Taiwan. After that, he has all these listed different ideas from tea possibilities to fruit uh, possibilities to coffee possibilities to other spice possibilities. We have you know, this long list of everything that we could possibly find in Asia and then we, we, we combined it with the base beers that are av vastly available on the market and then he did his magic, you know, kind of cross-reference and check which ones actually pairs up better. Like, I was very inspired when I came here by, you know, the street food and the, you know, the typical dishes here cooked with, uh, cooked with basil and uh, I thought, I, I'd never 
heard of a basil beer before and I've only seen once, one since. We want to brew beer for the local market mainly, of course this is our home, so we're brewing, we're brewing beer for the people who live here in Taiwan. And I think we have to, uh, there's a different, I mean to start with, you have a different, different climate, yeah, so it's much warmer. So that's why we really stay low with the ABVs. We want to have drinkable beers and we want people to um, enjoy or at least give them the chance to enjoy more than one beer. Um, so that's why we don't really specialize in high ABV IPAs or, or, or um, beers with, which are also trendy, like sour beers, etc., etc. But I, I believe that's not really for the uh, you know bigger market uh, for for the consumers here. We make a lot of beer that's imitating historic styles, but. What we really want to create, for example, this, uh, this pale jade, it's about creating that unique flavor that, that's unique to local grains, coming from that local corn um, that, that was brought here by the, by the Dutch. So that's kind of what we want to create. It's uh, something that's unique to here, something that you can only get it here. We're in a subtropical weather, but we're, the, the type of rice it's actually a temperate weather crop. And most people don't know that. Uh, our fruit culture is so heavily influenced by Japanese. And uh, most of our rice we're eating are basically what Japanese are eating. We're not eating long grains. But in Ch mainland China, most of the Chinese food, they come with long grains instead of short grains. So the rice that goes into Taiwan here, mm -hmm. is that a local Taiwanese rice or is it? Yes, it is. It's called Peng Lai. It's basically short grains. Peng Lai means actually Taizong Liu Su Hao. The particular, the name of its cultivar is called Taizong 65. Uh, prior to the Japanese era, it was not grown here. And that was the very first rice that Japanese actually import from outside of Japan. Yeah, that's why it's so it's so uh, significant. It's very significant towards like the whole, I would say the whole food culture in South Southeast Asia because that's the very first, Japanese won't allow any rice to be imported. What's given Taiwan beer its unique flavor? Uh, not exactly, but it definitely gives that, and it brings, it does have that rice feel to it. You know, it gives that, um, that clean crispness of Taiwan beer. Our most uh, popular beer is this, the golden Taiwan beer. Uh, one of the most uh, specific and significant gradient is Peng Lai rice, which is produced from the Yunlin, and uh, it, which make our beer a very special flavor and taste. This is Taiwan's most popular beer. This is 使用了差不多四十几年的台湾啤酒的配方它主要里面的配方就是啤酒大麦芽啤酒花还有红莱米还有那个酵母水这几样东西主要它有比较特殊的就是加了红莱米我 striving for 100% local like we already kind of try to do that with the barley so that's that's a lot of a lot of pain. So the barley, was that easy to produce? It's easier. Because Taiwan used to grow it like... It used to grow it throughout Taiwan. Yeah. Because um, instead of making beer, we used to use barley to make tea. It's a barley tea. So we used to have that. Uh, use six row barley and yeah. So we used to have that. So that's part of our culture. I think. This beer is called Schlafen Good Beer, right? Um, <clears throat> so this is a second version with this artist. Um, it kind of represents like how our agriculture industry is evolving. Like for example, this particular Chinese herb is growing wildly, like in the wilderness. And in Taidong, in the east side of Taiwan, it's just pretty much everywhere. And People only harvest it when, when people actually buy it. It just, it's, it's like weed, it's just growing wildly. 
So, um, I think that's part of, and after making this beer, I think it modified our philosophy in terms towards making beer. Um, local flavor is very important, but what brings out to, to that local flavor, a lot of it is a local culture. And that particular crop has become part of a local culture. It does, it does have a monetary value to it, but it's, it's not so apparent. And it's kind of part of our job to bring that monetary value to all the crops that's growing on this island. And I think that, that's another thing that really makes this company unique. For us, at our brewery, um, our standard wheat beer is brewed with 50% uh, wheat and all the wheat we use in this wheat beer is are all grown in Taiwan are all local wheat we don't use uh, one grain of, of imported wheat and, and that's I think that's um, something we're very proud of I always feel like Taiwanese wheat is a bit more uh, bready uh, a bit more uh, a bit denser than uh, imported ones you know, Taiwan has never been known for growing um, uh, wheat or barley or any kind of uh, any kind of these uh, uh, beer ingredients. But um, just through uh, passion and through uh, you know a passion of a brewer and a lot of the people involved in the industry, that we can push for the farmers to grow these uh, to grow wheat and to let us use it in beer. I think that's I think the point of pride is there, and that we could, we, our passion is so moving that we can move the industry. I think our wheat beer is definitely a diff, uh, brewed in a different style than most other wheat beers, um, and we, and this style I think, um, um, is more unique. So you can taste, uh, you, you have more ability to taste uh, the different ingredients. So what, what is that style? So we uh, we use a Belgian. Uh, Wheat, be uh, wheat beer inspired style, but we, we don't use the, 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 we call it a white ale because we don't use the whipbeer beer yeast, we use a different yeast. Um, we also add the orange peel and, and the coriander seeds, so it's, it's the spiciness of, of, these, of the, the, the spice I was mentioning and um, that combination with um, the local wheat. And uh, uh, and also because local wheat is is um, it's not malted, it's not wheat malt. So uh, a, a Belgian inspired wheat beer style is actually better because um, in a traditional Belgian style you would only you would use raw wheat instead of wheat malt, um, um, which is a huge difference between the Belgian style and the German style. We're still mainly uh, into. Team. I had brewing experience while I was in the States. Other than making beer, well, we grow a lot of our own ingredients initially. We do a lot of cultivation. Uh, we start off with a handful of grains, seeds, and it took us uh, six years to get to actually become part of the ingredients that's putting our beer. This beer is a, a corn-based beer. We got our seed, the initial seeds from uh, NTU. Then we start cultivating in uh, Hualien, which is a city east of Taiwan. Less pollution, uh, it's a more natural setting compared to like the, the west coast. That's initially we want to grow all our ingredients, but like for temperate weather crops like wheat, barley, it took us it basically the whole cultivation has been it's completely diminished. It's completely gone since the 1980s. So we kind of start bringing that back slowly. But some crops are still growing there. Like we was still growing there. So we kind of utilizing that 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 climate over there and the how familiar farmers there's with the, these temperate crops. So. Our barley are still growing there. So now, how much of your uh, grain comes from Taiwan? Well, right now, like most of our beer come are around like twenty to thirty percent. To yeah, to thirty percent. But uh, because right now we don't have the malting industry here. So malt is not grown here. Well, the ingredients are grown here. The grains are grown here. 
but Mozart right now we still have to use uh, import. So when you started up, you, mm -hmm. you were coming from an agricultural background. Mm -hmm. Is that how you approach the flavor and how you're going to produce your food? Yes, I would say uh, brewers are more like a, well, more like chefs. Um, my strength is I, I know more grains. I know different variety of grains, different cultivars. Um, how how will help us to improve the flavor? Because um, the protein to carbohydrate ratio, um, when we cultivate it, what goes in there, what secondary metabolites that we're creating, uh, we're extracting, um, that definitely give me some edge over other brewers. A lot of flavor that we get, especially from grains, are directly from the secondary metabolites. So um, that definitely, that would definitely go into a beer because the more, more of certain compound that you get, it hits your palate easier. And in terms of aroma, um, yeah, I did part of my research in terms of like the organolactic qual quality, like in terms of flavors, you know, mouthfeel, <clears throat> those type of th those things. So that definitely helps me like when I'm creating our, our beer. So do you think other brewers have that knowledge? Hopefully they do. <laughs> uh, I, I would say their approach will be a little different than how we approach our flavors. Taiwan used to grow hops commercially, like back in the days, in the 80s. It's difficult to grow here. It's, it's difficult. Try to grow um, our own hops here. Um, obviously it's not that big of a success so far, but you know, these are some of the samples of you know, hops that we've grown um, just outside our brewery. Um, um, when they're fresh, they're definitely, um, they're, they, they're actually, um, they have their own flavors that are very interesting. But um, so far we've only been able, this is probably all the hops we could collect in, in one harvest. So we, we were so uh, happy that we could actually get these plants to flower. Um, we, we didn't want to uh, use any of it. We just wanted to keep them in, a free, in the freezer as, a keeps, uh, as keepsakes, just to remind ourselves that we could, we could do something like this. But what makes Taiwan really special is like, we can grow tropical produce all the way to temporary produce. It's, of course, the EO is not going to be as good. And because it's so, it's so, uh, so wet, it's so humid, when we grow a lot of things, there's a lot of like this, uh, disease and pests. Um, but that comes, that makes people like me important, <laughs> you know? Technology <laughs> helps. Yeah, but technology helps a lot, but a lot of it is uh, what makes us important because we have that, put, we have that knowledge in cultivation. So why did it stop? It's kind of the globalization, and I think a lot of contribute due to uh, the TTL, because TTL is a state-owned company. So when it they comes to... Grow it. They grow it, yeah. They so, grow. you know, once the government do it, a lot of time, the quality of these crops are not going to be as good. And, and eventually, when you have... In terms of like grain qualities, when, when the produce quality is just not there, there's no reason for them to purchase what's in. It's cheaper for them to produce, uh, yeah. purchase outside. Yeah, so that kind of died down since the 80s. So it's the barley production. So it's really a pity, you know, like if we started this project back in the 80s, it would have been so easy because every, we can source everything easily. You think it could be developed? So you're growing your own hops and wheat and malt? No, I think it's pass impossible because the market is so small. So even you, you, you grow your own hub or your moat, the amount is not big enough to, to reach a reasonable price. We can make the farmer that produce these crops being proud of what they do and they can see a product, you know, that's, that's in the market. And it's, they know because their effort is directly in, go into this product and that brings value to, to the community, to, you know, to the agriculture industry. 
North of Taipei City, a Danchui based brewer uses local ingredients. I started my beer business in Danchui areas and to looking for something possible to create the local flavors. I know the histories about the Danchui Oak Tree, like the cold Chongjian Jie. So I go there to meet the Aaron to know he created a lot of different kinds of flavors. So have the idea to come back to the beer. It's possible it can be a kind of new flavors. Our herbs beer, all the herbs is come from this herb beer place. I grow all these herbs in the mountain area. Herbs always have in the beer brewery process, but actually the herbs also a kind of a herb. We make every year an indulgence. We make a botanic. It's uh, with the herbs, like uh, cloves, uh, rosemary inside. People like a lot of it, beers with spice, spicy herbs. So a lot of herbs is, is also integrated now in beer. People want green, more, more nature-wise. We want to with one with the with the nature. So a lot of brewery also make sometimes one with herbs or one herb, two herbs. But now everything is more international. So like in the cook, Italian cooking, you have a lot of herbs. So Asian culture, they also try uh, try now new taste the Italian herbs. In the past, you, you won't find any Italian herbs in, in Asia. But it's, it's coming up more the mix of the Asia culture to Europe and Europe culture to Asia. The most special thing in our brewery is we always doing the firm, uh, re secondary fermentation in the bottle. So we bottle our beer, the beer is still no carbon that carbon dioxide. So we bottle in and we put into the 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 cool room and we doing like the two week like a two week we call it the bottle age. So after two week the yeast in the bottle they consume the like a priming sugar. Priming sugar is mean we ate we ate the sugar not for the sweet not for the sweetness we ate the sugar a little bit because the yeast can consume the sugar and uh, into in the bottle and but uh, bottle is already kept so the carbon dioxide don't escape so they keep keep the carbon dioxide in the in the bottle this process is the same like a, like a champagne. Well, real ale by our definition is a beer that continues to undergo what's called secondary fermentation in the container from which it is served, which sounds quite technical, but basically what it means is there's still live yeast in either the cask or the bottle or the can that it's served from, and it can continue to mature and change and those flavours develop. Um, not all craft beer has to be real ale. Some craft beers can be pasteurised, they can be filtered, they cannot have any live yeast left in them. Many of them do, um, and most of them we, we'd say actually that's real ale. The beer after the secondary fermentation in the bottle, they will create like a, like a more well balanced. So if it goes to the bottle age or bottle condition, so the beer is, is have a more why don't other brewers in Taiwan follow your system of double yeasting? Because it takes a long time. Because after I, I bottle my beer, I have to wait maybe more than two weeks in the children. So the other brewer, they, they want to bottle it. And uh, after bottle it, they can sell it, sell beer uh, right now. This process become our, um, you can say, unique. Yeah, it's it's like the I think it's the advantage of of North Taiwan brewing because the other brewery don't do that. If you like Belgian style beer, you will understand why we focus on this purpose. Yeah, if you but if you don't drink a uh, Belgian style beer. You don't understand. We take uh, we take a lot of time, a lot of effort 
to keep this old tradition. We've been in the craft beer industry in Taiwan for a, about five years now. Uh, we do everything from distribution, uh, we have craft beer bars, we also brew in Taiwan. Um, and uh, now this is the first international beer festival we've done. Right now you're seeing, uh, there's certain beers that you're seeing a, a big boom in right now. Uh, guava is a big one. So guava is like, it was mostly a Southeast Asian thing to add into beer. And now you're seeing breweries in America, breweries in the UK, all using guava in their IPAs. So I think, I think it's something that stemmed from Asia. There's a lot of Taiwan fruits, flavors, and local fruits. Do you think some of those flavors work in the beer here? It's, it's sweet. It does, it's a it's, uh, fashion. It, doesn't, it, it won't last long. So do you think those flavors would travel back to Europe very well? Uh, European uh, consumers are more critical for this. They won't like it. So the market for Taiwan fruit beers could be quite limited in the West? It's because in Taiwan fruit beer, they use lager beer. In Belgium is high fermented white beer. It's a mix of white and ale. So lager beer and you know, white ale, it's different of uh, the shelf life one, the taste. And then you use the one is sweet syrup and the other is fruit juice. So when you drink it, when you know to drink it, you know the difference. So you make if you like sweet, you, you will use the drink the Taiwan. Uh, it's like Coca Cola or it's like a soda. Or you will like that, and you want to have a little bit alcohol inside. Okay, but the fruit beer of Belgium doesn't matter which brand. They all use a high fermentation beer. We, in Belgium, there's some brewery also say we have lager fruit beer. You just use lager beer with fruit juice. Then the shelf life is, is cheaper and the shelf life is, is less. So if they change the brewing techniques here, there might be a chance sending it back. If they change it, yeah. If they change the, the technique and the quality, they might have a chance to survive in Europe. But otherwise it won't survive because European consumers are more critical for the product, for quality. We just brew the uh, traditional beer. So the flavor for us, there is no strawberry, no um, any kind of fruit, mango fruit inside. So why did you decide not to use fruit in your beers? For us, there are two reasons. One reason is because, because um, beer, Beer should have their own uh, flavor, special special name for the special um, recipe, and then we like to make it more like um, craft beer because you you eat fruit fruit fruits in the beer, it tastes it tastes not like beer. It's a little bit like juice, a little bit like juice. So so we prefer to make traditional beer.现在的台湾啤酒有很多人都加果汁进去想要发展台湾的所谓的水果的在地那其实啤酒放果汁进去它并不是一个那么好发酵在发酵的时候它很难去解决果汁的问题那其实应该用更单纯的想法就是啤
Uh, I don't see it evolving too quickly. Has the influence of foreign brewers employed by Taiwanese brands changed flavors? It's not so much connected to, to Germany. There are amazing brewers in the UK yeah. and uh, in Belgium and yeah. uh, in North America and South America, in Africa, in Asia. So that you'll find good brewers everywhere. But the influence of you must have a big impact on the guys here. In I think it's the science, science side also, his creativity, his love no, absolutely. For, for beers. Absolutely. So again, like going back to craft, you know, um, I think it's the art and the science, right? So um, I think his German side representing a thousand percent of, you know, the practice that we are applying here on a day-to-day -day basis. The flavor didn't change then when it, Fritz came on board? It, it changed. But it changed in a way that we, we actually have discussions on like how do we want to interpret craft beer from like a Taiwanese... So the flavour kind of improved? Uh, well, that's a... Uh, of course it did. It, it improved <laughs> because he came, yes. Like in terms of the uh, consistency, the quality, yes. And I think the diversity also came in. Can you imagine that Chris was American? Can you imagine this, the flavors, the styles that you'd be producing today? That's a very uh, interesting question. I would say yes and no. Yes, um, I think the American craft uh, breweries or brewers, they are known for their, let's say, I don't know if this is the right terminology, excuse me if it's not. They're more outrageous in terms of you know trying things. They're more experimental, right? And um, Chris is not lacking of that, but he is just more subtle when it comes to bringing new ideas to the table. He doesn't just tell you, "Hey, I want to brew this," and I don't care. I just want to try this out. You know, he in a way it's very funny. He's somewhat more Asian in that way. The flavor, uh, which uh, for the buckskin beers, this is a typical. German brewed beers, which, uh, which has the same flavor profile, which you also can find in Germany. The flavor of the German beers, especially brewed, of, or brewed after the Reinheitsgebot from 1516, um, that you can feel and taste uh, the hard work into this product. And, um, have the, and the, in German you say handwerklich, which means a craft style for these beers. In, in Taiwan, uh, a lot of people don't drink craft beer, but a lot of Taiwanese, they know about the popu uh, popularity of the German beer. So Kavalan, they decide to focus on brewing all the German, German beer style. Was that because of the way that TTL is brewed? I think yes. TTL, which is now uh, looked at all the craft beer here mm -hmm. and have decided to make their own style of craft beer. Um, where does that leave Buckskin? I see the German, German style beer is more drinkable than the other, like a pale ale, like a IPA, like a stout, or like porter. So Buckskin, they won't brew style like that. So, Lager is more for for Taiwanese consumer. Lager is more suitable and uh, more drinkable than air in Taiwan. In my opinion, English English style is a good beer. Why? Than the German. The German beer is uh, so boring. The beer has a uh, two style: the air and lager. The, the German always close to the lager, but in his uh, ingredient always have the four malt, hops, yeast, and the water, not else. But England has a merry style. They have the uh, coffee, milk, oat, and uh, Everything he can can use in the in the beer, so it's a very very uh, multiple. This is American tastes, right? So uh, it took Taiwanese a little bit to get on board with those tastes.
but we kind of believe in doing a more um, authentic experience. Um, I think a lot of people know that if you're going to drink a 23 beer, you'll get more of an authentic American style uh, craft beer. Almost all our beers are American style. Yeah, a lot of hops, uh, a lot of hop characteristics in our beer. The U.S. is known for big hop flavors, using a lot of hops, using a lot of different types of hops, uh, high IBUs. That's sort of the way that we uh, wanted to present ourselves in Taiwan. And uh, to our knowledge, we're Taiwan's first IPA. Uh, so we were the ones who really brought that sort of IPA hop culture here. I remember when we gave our contract brewer the recipe, when we brewed our first batch of IPA, he thought that we had missed a decimal point. He thought we were adding so many hops that we had done the math wrong. Before we started brewing, everyone was doing more lagers, sort of light blonde ales, things like that. Uh, no one was really going for the big hop uh, characteristics, which we knew was already really popular in the U.S. So we thought, let's try it here, and it was a risk. Uh, a lot of people think, thought it couldn't be done. Pacific Northwest has really been uh, uh, sort of driving that. You know, a traditional IPA would have been brewed with Fuggles and Goldings and would have been 7.5%, um, which would have been quite strong for the British market. But nowadays they've got a West Coast IPA, which is brewed with a lot more American hops, more intensity, very citrusy, quite challenging to drink sometimes. Um, but uh, the easy drinking side of things has disappeared a little bit. So uh, it's, it's the American influence has made things a little bit uh, more challenging to drink. But uh, in America they call it hop creep. What happens is the first beers you drink are quite easy to drink and then the bigger the flavors you get, the less you want to go back down the scale and the, you creep up the scale and get to some very hoppy beers, which is where that American influence is coming in. A lot of people are still on the uh, Taiwan beer, you know, lager train, which, you know, back in America, five, seven years ago, people were still drinking Budweiser all the time. So I totally understand what people are going through. Uh, eventually, they'll come and try a beer like this, and they'll say, oh, wow, you know, beer can really taste great. And they'll probably shift some of their, you know, beer money every month towards craft beer. The craft beer market in Asia is, is growing at a, at a, at a, a vast rate. Um, the, the younger generation are getting tired of drinking the mainstream lagers. They're looking for more flavor, more intensity in their beers, so it, it's developing quite nicely. They're looking for the more intense flavors. There's still a, a lot of Germanic style lagers and, and, and uh, half of Ice's wheat beers, but they're also going for the sort of more intense pale ales and IPAs. It's slow developing, but it's coming along. In Taiwan, we're selling quite a lot of English varieties um, for the main drinkability and sessionability of beers. Um, but there's also some more intense European and American uh, hops getting into the market for the more flavorful, stronger alcohol beers. The American style was too heavy for Taiwan people. I would say, like I hear the most famous popular style in the US, it's not really fit to the flavor of Taiwan. But we can learn from them, like uh, we can brew some like American pale ale. We still can learn from the brewing idea from the U.S. But we uh, we ch we can choose. There are so many styles in the world to brew. We don't have to follow what American breweries doing. But we can only choose a little bit of their part. The English IPA is supposed to have that green sweetness, that caramel sweetness. Go with that very strong tropical fruit hoppiness but what's important is that sweetness for the past 10 years the u.s craft beer market they have we've gone to such an extreme of that creating that big hoppy flavor but we forgot what's a balance um, i think a lot of people when they're crafting beers they forget to have the balance and uh, it's very difficult to achieve that balance. And I think a lot of the, most of the award-winning beers back in America and in the world have uh, this incredible balance between the malt and the hops and the residual sugar and the yeast, uh, whatever ingredients they're using. And I think we have achieved uh, that balance with this beer. It's just a really uh, sessionable, uh, smooth, easy drinking, you know, grapefruit kind of flavored uh, pale ale. If you're going to name one country as the best for brewing, who would you select? I think the US. You have incredible, crazy 
uh, uncompromised breweries in, in the US. And you, some days you just sit on your chair. What is that? It's so so crazy. Why do you think that is? Because it is. I tasted I tasted a lot of them, and there's no match. Uh, but they, they have influence from Europe. But they changed it. And sometimes the um, Americans can be like Japanese. You know, when they do something, they go all the way through it, m better than anyone else. I was in China in March. All in, in China in the craft market there, it was all about American hops. So the flavors are definitely catching hold there in these different countries. And wherever you go now, people are looking for a bit more intensity of flavors. Do you think America's leading the way that we're drinking in terms of flavor now? I think certainly for uh, some years they were, but it comes full circle because many of the American craft brewers were initially inspired by the wave of new microbreweries in the UK back in the 70s. So it comes full circle and, and it's now a worldwide industry where there's cross fertilization of ideas from all across the world, from brewers in New Zealand, Australia and America, in um, you know, India, all over the place are just all contributing to this great excitement about beer and flavour. I think for a lot of expats here, the, the, this Australian style beer is a little different to what they're used to. Um, I think it's a good thing though. Um, I think a lot of people have found that refreshing and just like not that feeling of drinking just another IPA or just another lager. In terms of Taiwan's exposure to uh, Australia in general, like their knowledge of food and culture and beer and wine is very limited. Sort of the last few years that you yeah. actually, it's, it's very like saturated by uh, the US culture and, uh, yeah. and maybe some European culture, but um, it's only sort of the last few years, I would say, that they're kind of being exposed to these new places and ideas and, you know, styles of food and, and wine and beer and alcohol, yeah. like, you know, different liquors or, or anything, you know, so it's, yeah, it, it makes it for an interesting time, and I think that's part of one of the great things of Taiwan is that they are they are sort of new to this, but they're also very open people yeah. to this, right? They're sort of, you know, little baby steps, but they're definitely, they're interested in these sorts of things, so. Basically, it was just my wife and I from the, from the start, and like none of us had any experience in, in business, really, you know? Uh, like I knew, I knew how to brew, but knowing how to brew and opening up a brewery are two totally different things. So we basically had to learn as we as we went, essentially, you know. And so basically, every little thing was a challenge. This is what we started with this little system here. Uh, it's a very simple uh, two-vessel brew house, and uh, so basically. Uh, one batch is 100 liters, and the fermenters over there are 200 liters. So basically, we have to brew two times in a day to fill one fermenter. We got it really cheap from China, but that also meant that it gave us a lot of headaches at the very beginning. So we had to spend even more time and money to get it fixed. and you know, upgrading parts and buying more parts, et cetera, et cetera, just to get it work. When we started six years ago, the craft beer thing here in Taiwan was just getting started. So we were kind of in a, in a, in a good place, in a good space and time to start the brewery here in Taiwan. Making beer is the easy part, you know, actually going and selling the beer and marketing the beer and marketing the brand that's the that's the that's the tough part. So in, in America, a lot of people now keep wanting to have a different type of beer. There's, oh, a, yeah. there's a big change. They got to have something new. That's also a phenomenon that's happening here in Taiwan. Like people want something something new. You know, everybody, uh, at least in the the people that are into craft beer, once they had once they had they've had one, it's okay. Check next. And the same with uh, tap room owners or managers. You know, once they go through a keg, they're asking the brewery, okay, something new, because otherwise people are, people are not gonna come, you know? So everybody's playing catch up with the market. That is a huge challenge here. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer, and now I'm 62, and I'm very interested in brewing beer. Uh, the first I brew 
appear in my kitchen. Two years ago, I started to manage the factory. This is the first machine I made. It produces about 60 liters of beer. Uh, this is a mesh machine. This is with beer. This recipe is about 50% of wheat and 50% of more. This beer is some, somehow mm, same as TTL. So I think this is maybe more accessible for Taiwan people. I, I made two kinds of beer and this is IPA. Oh, it, I think it, uh, it is very easy to find the recipe in the internet, but there are many, many kinds. And I try many times. And after that, I choose the uh, yeast from England. Uh, it comes from, I, I, I never been there. <laughs> it comes uh, from a county called Burton. I really like the British IPAs, um, so I'm not a huge fan of the American style IPAs, um, just because they're everywhere. I think it's more suitable, um, if you want to do a true to style IPA, I think it's more suitable to go the British road. It's, it's the hops and the yeast. Um, the, the American style uh, IPAs are really exciting because of their citrusy notes mm -hmm. and I want to use the citrusy notes in a different context, so in different beers. Like for all of our beers we use uh, English malt actually. English malt I think it's, it's more biscuity, a little bit maltier, especially the, the crystal malts and the, the specialty malts. Uh, we've been producing uh, malted barley um, for about 150 years in North Norfolk area and British um, growing conditions for barley are fantastic. We've been growing malting barley in the UK for probably thousands of years actually and the soil and the weather are, are combined to um, produce barleys which are very low in protein and therefore they're high in, in sugar um, and when a, when a barley is low in protein it's very easy to work with in the brewery. So the British brewing tradition and methods have really grown up hand in hand with the type of barley that we're able to grow in the UK. That low protein ma makes the, the processability very easy in the, in, in the brewery and so British brewing is just one single temperature. Um, whereas in the US and in Germany, um, they, they tend to have to work the, the, the malt a lot more in the brewery. It's a bit more complicated, especially in, in the continent. In Germany, they've got a very complicated brewing system um, with different vessels and different temperature programs in the brewery. Um, but uh, we don't need to do that in the UK and it all really comes back to the barley. Do you think it will be difficult trying to convince a Taiwanese to drink this style of beer? I, 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 I don't know now. <laughs> And I, I think I'm go, going to find out. <laughs> From the latest brewery to Taiwan's oldest, TTL built a craft beer brewery in 2017. After the beer marketing is open to the worldwide, and we have very many very foreign beer coming to Taiwan, and people start finding that the beer can, could be uh, various fa flavor and tester and people start to try new beer, which influenced our beer selling. And so our company decided to develop the craft beer because to compare with the foreign beer, building time is about almost one year. The cost is about 200 million New Taiwan dollars. Not the usual place to find a brewery. But this brewer brews on the 11th floor. We uh, set us uh, as a micro brewery, so we try every style of beer. Craft beer is more uh, suitable for uh, taste it and uh, try the flavor, rich flavor. 
brewing is uh, interesting because I major in in science, so you know that the the procedure procedure and you you can control the thing, and if you know how how to brew, you can make uh, the beer you wanna make. And I think Taiwan have more Taiwan have a lot of in ingredient, uh, excellent ingredient like fruit or something, and we can use it to combine it with our beers. I ended up here in Taiwan, <laughs> very accidentally. I mean, Taiwan doesn't even have a, a big beer culture, as everybody know, four or five years ago. But now, these days, oh, when I came here, maybe three or four microbreweries uh, existed, but now, like, they're popping up like mushrooms. It's like beautiful, you know, it's a big, 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 big market, big, big industry now. And, um, Many, many people bringing beautiful, interesting beers. Many people from different countries coming in, bringing their experience, um, expertises into the country. Um, that makes the competition tougher, but it's nicer, and brings, uh, brings more, better beers out for everybody. And for the Taiwanese customer, by itself, he has more choice, and not only um, relies on beers what's coming in from other countries, he can also more likely taste beers what get brewed in his own country, and can see, you know, and people trying also bringing local fruits, local vegetables, a lot of local things like, you know, things into the beers as well. So um, lots of interesting um, products coming out, lots of interesting beers, you know. And I'm, what I'm trying to do is I try to show the people the original way of each country, where the or original uh, beer type is coming from, the tradition, everything is like, because what I found is when people, some craft brewers or they, they're making beers and then they're putting the wrong name on it. They don't stay really with the tradition and they're confusing the customer. So am I trying to make sure that this is the, tra the right tradition with the right beer, with the right name, with the right alcohol level, the right hops and everything is involved with what exactly is the type of the beer or the style or whatever, you know. So, and I'm looking, um, I'm using my experience, uh, what I actually learned in all these particular countries and I'm making, bringing these beers out and just like, you can, you can drink exactly the, the same beer, what for example, uh, Meet England can offer you, okay? You can drink it here. Or an Imperial Russian Stout, what they made many, many years ago. You can drink it here. Or a real German lager from the mountains where I'm from. You can drink it here. Uh, I'm also making um, mango beers from Ping Dong Mangos I'm using for Taiwan people feeling like they're having a beer for themselves. Education is really important, right? For people to really understand what craft beer, like to enjoy craft beer, they need to understand what craft beer is first. The challenging part was to try and educate the consumer, right? Because let's say if we started making IPAs and like copier beers, and everybody's like, oh, this is too bitter or oh, this is too strong. The craft beer industry now is developing, but it's still in a very early stage. And so, of course, most of the people, they are limited by their experience. Uh, today is an uh, education class uh, for public. Uh, today I'm going to introduce uh, how to brew beer a very, from the very best point of view and introduce the raw material. And today I prepare the mold and the hops. At the end, we have a uh, testing. Uh, testing our, our beer and show everyone how to enjoy, how to uh, test those craft beer. Education is very important. Uh, I can give ideas to, to everyone how to enjoy, how to experience the, the beautiful of the craft beer. The reason why we are here today is trying to educate the more people to let them know actually the beer is more than a lager. Actually, there's plenty out of the style out there. And in Taiwan, I would say this market is not big enough. So we're trying to, during this opportunity, to explore more potential customers during the testing session and during the, this kind of education events to try to involve and trying to involve more people, more understanding about it, the beers. Crab beers, I think it's very, very different from the, like, uh, the normal beers, like the laggers, like uh, the Taiwan beer or the, the, um, the Budweiser. Most of the Taiwanese, they will be surprised. For example, like IPA. The first, when they smell this beer, this kind of beer, well, they will think, wow, this smells pretty good and smells very fruity. And they will think about, oh, this beer must be very sweet or like, must like, add many fruits. 
But actually, uh, after after they smell it and, or they drink it, I will say that I will tell them this beer has no any fruit ingredients in the beer, and they will be very surprised why uh, like no more in, uh, beer ingredients can have that kind of flavor. Yes, um, I will say uh, I will tell them about uh, like some uh, little beer knowledge about uh, like an IPA. I would say that all the fruity smells, all the aromatic um, flavor, aromatic smells is all from the hops. And they will think it's very, very different from the beer they have drink. Maybe, uh, the ordinary drink like Taiwan beers, like Hennigan's, like Budweiser. The way that Taiwanese approach alcohol is very different from Europeans. The alcohol culture here is about cheering with someone all the time. So I think it's a nice, uh, nice introduction to craft beer. So you see, we're not that far away from the way you drink, although we drink it slower than them. But I think as a, as a whole here, I don't think uh, it's not really ingrained in the culture to drink beer in their free time. It is for some people, but in America, it's like 95% of the population drinks, you know, here I feel like it's 50%. How I perceive beer is, you know, in, in Europe, it's something that kids drink. Even kids drink beer. It's not, it's not supposed to be a flavor that's acquired. It's supposed to be a flavor that's generally accepted. Two years ago, we only for craft beer to make a special area. And this year we have around 10 exhibitors for craft beer. We can see many craft beer brands in Taiwan now. So Taiwan, I think Taiwan people can choose their own drink habit easier before. Craft beer is not very popular in Taiwan. I think the uh, young, youngest group will buy the craft beer and all this group will buy the TTL. I think um, craft beer is more uh, suitable for uh, taste it and uh, try the flavor, rich flavor, rather than just get drunk. Me, I, I don't really like to be drunk because uh, you still have to, to to be home, to come home. So uh, if you're really drunk, uh, it's still embarrassing. <laughs> so. So I, I don't want to be embarrassing. Most of the customers, uh, they came into a, a tap room or a craft beer place. They wanna, they wanna experience uh, like the very good flavor from the from craft beer. So I don't think they wanna get drunk. Maybe they wanna get tipsy, but I don't think they wanna get drunk. For the generation like us, maybe 30 or 40 years, this kind of a new generation, they still think uh, to be polite, to be well-mannered uh, is very important uh, uh, in, in this society. I think for older generation, uh, in the past maybe uh, 20 or 30 years ago, in Taiwan they are blue color, so uh, they, they, they more uh, belong to um, a worker uh, to, 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 to do something, and uh, they, they think after work, uh, they like to drink a lot to, um, to be drunk and forget everything today and uh, to be uh, 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 COVID a day after uh, drunk. But uh, for the younger generation, maybe we've become more uh, white color. So uh, the, 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 the working style is totally different than before. In, in Taiwan uh, uh, culture, uh, female uh, especially for older generation, female uh, to drink is not uh, is not really allowed. But today, if you look at this tasting we've been in today, it's yeah, fifty fifty male. Female. Yes. So there's a lot of females now drinking beer. beer. Yeah, I, I think uh, this is really due to uh, the fact that craft beer. Uh, I think uh, just my, my my observation for. Uh, the female uh, to drink um, queer beer, uh, they 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 can maybe they can uh, taste more different. And uh, for drip, drip, drip queer beer, they don't drink a lot, so uh, it's a high classic uh, 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 happy for them to drink queer beer. The ladies, they prefer uh, more. They don't like beer like a, a lager beer, but they like fruit beer. It's different. So. 
we developed that fruit beer especially for the woman who doesn't drink beers. Uh, it depends on person actually. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the ladies, so, um, they like strong alcohol beer. That's, that's of course. They, if, if they know craft beer um, <coughs> deeply, if they enjoy craft beer, they may like the, the porter or strong, the strong alcohol beer. In the past, uh, especially, I'm not sure in Taiwan, even in the U.S., in the U.S., uh, the the male drink beer and they will have very big. Uh, 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 I, uh, in in Taiwanese, we call it a uh, pijou du, a uh, beer. Yeah, something like you. <laughs> so, but so it's not good for a, a female uh, t to drink too much and uh, have uh, this kind of. Uh, a, a, a body shape. I think we sell the most Guinness in Taiwan here. The majority of our customers here are Taiwanese. They come in for the Guinness, well, certainly after they've been in one time, they come in for Guinness. No, I think they're interested in the fact that it's, it's, it's almost like a, an Irish symbol and the symbol of an Irish bar, that they want to try it. Even the girls like to try it now. And they're, they're doing the Instagram and the, and the Snapchat. Uh, yeah, it's like a the symbol of Ireland, whether we like it or not. The large number of our um, customers are people who've worked or studied in the UK, um, particularly students, you know, gone there and done their master's degrees, come back to tai Taiwan, feel a bit homesick for England. So with many craft breweries setting up all, all over Taiwan now, do you think that has a knock-on effect to customers coming here to try all your the European flavors? It's hard to say. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's really affected us much. I think the craft beer shops themselves are feeling the competition, for sure. Um, you know, and certainly that must be evinced very much in terms of their pricing. We have to price la high to keep our company survival. Because uh, there's a very, very special, even in the world, only Taiwan, the one company, one beer company, controls 16% of uh, marketing. And uh, Taiwan has a long uh, monopoly history of the uh, beer industry. Taiwanese don't drink a lot of beer, even craft beer. They say Taiwanese only drink like uh, 20, 20 liters per year. So it's, it's a very, very small amount. Business is very difficult. We have to price higher so we can make money, even, even break even. Craft beer have to be very, um, not very uh, inexpensive. Now, because the uh, craft beer, most of the craft beer is imported from other countries, the price is quite high. So we like to brew the uh, beer by ourselves and lower the price and everybody can afford it. At the 2019 World Beer Awards in London, Asian brewers are well represented. For this season particularly, we've seen a lot more Asian entries, uh, particularly from China, Taiwan, Japan. It's a really grown market and we've seen particularly in the last round of judging now, We've got some fabulous winners and very surprisingly in very established categories such as wheat beer, we've seen uh, Chinese, Taiwanese winners coming through, which is fabulous. Um, this one is uh, uh, Australia, the Golden Cup. I'm very happy this one in London, best for world. Yeah! Thank you, thank you. Have you seen more Asian brewers enter? If you consider that there's only about 80 style winners worldwide, out of 3,500 entries, that is amazing. And it's really well done. So the future for Asian beer could be quite strong? I think it could be quite strong, especially because there's a market over there that's growing. Whereas the United States and even the UK sort of had their craft beer boom, that's just really starting to grow in Asia across. So I think we'll be seeing loads more interesting things coming out. And I know a lot of our entrants as well, they don't just come for the tasting, they'll tour the UK, so they'll really try to learn what's happening and try to replicate it back home. Has Taiwan created its own style and flavor 
of beer. All the Belgians, the Belgian style, the English style of beer, the German style of beer. Um, you you call those we call those styles because those beers have been those those beer styles have been around for you know hundreds of years. Um, you know Taiwan's beer has always been monopolized by the government for the longest time, and it's just starting to um, to boom and still start still starting to um, decide on what flavor represents Taiwan. It's going to be a bit hit or miss uh, with what I like. Um, sometimes uh, they'll make something where the flavor is really intended for the local craft beer drinkers who are just getting into craft beer. And that's something that, you know, as a brewer, I don't have to worry about. You know, so there are a lot of brews coming out of local breweries that when I drink them, it's an issue where like, I don't like it, but I respect it. You know, they'll have beers with very light flavors. You know, they'll be a little sweeter, maybe fruitier. Beers designed to get the attention of people who are used to drinking just Taiwan beer um, and introduce them slowly to craft beer drinking. Whereas, you know, if I tell your average Taiwanese beer drinker who drinks, you know, Taiwan beer and maybe, you know, other Japanese lagers and things like that and say, here, here's a 6% American stout with cinnamon in it. It's a bit of a big jump, you know, especially with cinnamon. We're here, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the local people feel like cinnamon reminds them of uh, Chinese medicine. You know, a lot of people don't like cinnamon here, which you have to understand. If you didn't grow up with the taste, it's a really strong flavor to be introduced to. I think beer is a, is a, is a great product that people have been enjoying for thousands of years. And at the same time, we have the privilege to interpret beer in a Taiwanese way. Taiwanese brewers have got, have got quite an uphill task here, haven't they? Oh yeah, I mean they have a really, really hard job to do of at once appealing to new beer drinkers, roping them in and getting them into craft beer, but also satisfying veteran craft beer drinkers which exist here not only in the foreign community but a lot of Taiwanese people as well have been into craft beer for a decade or longer and they want beers that satisfy both of those people often at the same time which can be a huge task for for anybody so they've done really creative things uh, to get you know into those markets. Europe has a very 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 long uh, tradition of beer especially Germany and it will take time. Uh, no one can take this from scratch. So we could have a Taiwan style of beer coming out of this. Absolutely. Um, and I think that that's a much more interesting proposition than toning down traditional beer styles to appeal to the local market. Um, I think if you're going to go with one or the other, yeah, make it your own, make it individual. Taiwan is still a country with um, getting the new beer knowledge and um, there are many, many beers in the market, but I don't think so that Taiwan has a uh, distinct flavor yet. Of our own style of beer, uh, it's really, really hard to create because in the world, most of the ingredients like half moss and yeast, they are already there. And there's so many talented brewers in the world that create new flavor like uh, New England IPA is a new trend beer style in the world. It's a, it, but it comes out for maybe almost 10 years. This, after in these 10 years, very, very few new style comes up because the ingredients are there. All the combination, most of the combination are already being used in the world. So here, for the normal customer, uh, for normal brewer, they like really hard to create a new style, if especially a Taiwan style beer. Do you think the Taiwanese style can travel to a, a worldwide ah. audience? I think so, yeah. Just as much as very hoppy beers, uh, you know, have basically conquered the world, yeah, and now everybody knows an IPA. Uh, nobody knows what it means, but everybody knows IPA, like those three letters are very, very uh, famous now. And I think, I think it could also work the other way. I don't think Taiwanese beer's flavor is a um, very lovely one. I think the flavor still have to be like get used to because um, 
this one has maybe 100 year history and we're just beginning. I have shared my beer with a ton of Taiwanese people uh, ranging from their early 20s all the way to you know their 50s maybe 60s um, and routinely uh, they all love my IPAs and the reason for that is that they're very fruity in their hop expression and they're not overly bitter um, so in some ways I don't think you really have to adapt I think if you do a style really well um, and just keep a few things in mind. Um, the local people, even if they've never had a craft beer before, can still really like it. Do you think making beer in Taiwan is difficult? Uh, difficult? Different to other countries? No. Why? I don't know. There's yeah. no reason. There's no reason why. They have electricity, they have water, they have air. There's everything there. What do you need? Yipijo来说的话,台湾是没有卖。对,我们这里气候,那对啤酒花也没有。那现在最主要我们台湾以农产品来讲的话,我们台湾的水果是很安全,很棒的。对,那所以我们目前选择的路线的话,可能就是会
getting more of the uh, population to be willing to take a chance. If, if the, the government um, uh, give, uh, cut some slack to the breweries, I mean, let them opening breweries in, in the city, um, this could be a major and huge change. Uh, craft beer, I think it really brings me uh, to a new uh, field that uh, opened my, my eye to, to see different types of diversity of uh, beer. So I like to try different flavor and uh, to enjoy different kind of culture. The future of the Taiwanese beer market is quite clear. I think it's about giving the Taiwanese people what they want. And I think in that way, it's about understanding the Taiwanese preference. It's about um, maintaining a high quality product and it's about communicating the product in the language that people understand. Right now, crab beer just started. So there's just still like, like so much market that we never discovered yet. Especially a lot of people in Taiwan, they never try what crab beer, they never try crab beer and they don't even know what it is, what this is. So I would say like we started it and there's a great future. Craft beer is going to stay um, and it has a, the potential to be very successful. Uh, because TTL has such a strong share, of the big share of the market, and Taiwanese people like change. Well, um, they, they're very uh, uh, the food culture is, is changing towards variety and all that. Uh, and that's my official answer, and I think there's a lot of potential. I think there's a big future, and my uh, my personal answer is. I don't know. If I knew, I'd be in the banks trying to get money, trying to build my next brewery, <laughs> you know? This beer is used in 所酿的第一款的全麦啤酒重现当时的那个麦芽味比较丰厚看起来那种醇厚感也出来那当然这香气上面我觉得这次的啤酒的苦啊the biggest the brewery in Taiwan market and we of course we have the vision that to work another hundred years and we have a lot of vision that we try to satisfy different kind of market or to create create or keep producing different products to satisfy the demand of multi market consumers. Still the nation's favorite beer after a hundred years, but what about the future? Taiwan has a diverse selection of beers and an amazing selection. The future is exciting, but the future is very challenging for the beer industry.